So, welcome Sean Bagshaw. Hi, how are you doing? Hey Oster, I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm not too bad, not too bad. Uh, we're Very both holed up in our bunkers, I think. In the bunkers, yep. A lot of us are these days. Well, it's the responsible thing to do, I think. Um, it's, it's the only way to go. Uh, so it's giving us plenty of time to do stuff like this, which is something you know we, we would struggle to do normally with our time. So, Right. I think that's uh, really something I'm thankful for, is that we have this capability to connect and reach out with each other in times like this. Uh, it's really made it possible for me to stay in touch with, with friends and family in a way that, you know, we never could before. That's right. That's right. I mean, 20 years ago, we would be on the phone, I suppose. But uh, yeah, yeah th this has made life very, very bearable. Now, I was uh, doing some reckoning the other day, and it's nine years since we first had a podcast conversation together. Uh, I was living in Spain, and uh, you were in Ashland. You were you were in your original house back in Oregon. And yeah, so much, isn't that crazy? And so much has changed. Yeah, it's uh, amazing what uh, what nine years will do. But I remember that that was a great conversation, and. Uh, it's been great keeping in touch with you all these years, and I'm looking forward to this one. Good, good. Well, hopefully we're going to get to do it again. Uh, I was speaking to Mark Adams the other day, and we're going to make a regular thing, and of course the, the regular chat with Adam Gibbs as well. So I think it's a great opportunity for us to bring in people with very diverse skill sets, uh, but with all very different creative approaches, uh, and try and find the common ground of the things that we do similarly, uh, and right. where the differences lie between what we also do. Now, right. before we get started, uh, I think you're very well known as an educator and a great photographer, but for people who might be unfamiliar with your work, that have been living in caves and dungeons for a lot longer than we have, uh, perhaps <laughs> you could briefly uh, introduce yourself and, and let people know who you are, where you are, and your experience in the field. Sure. Uh, my name's Sean Bagshaw. I, uh, I'm a, a photography geek. <laughs> I live in Southern Oregon and I've been doing the landscape photography thing for, for quite a while now. It, uh, it's been, been an amazing ride. I do landscape photography and also a lot of photography education. I was a middle school science and math teacher before I was a photographer. So over the years in my photography career, the education piece has really been a good fit, uh, allowing me to combine uh, my passions for both photography and teaching. So that's been, been great. And I've been doing uh, live education for, uh, boy, over a decade. And then at some point, uh, this kind of idea of video instruction and the ability to reach uh, such a large worldwide audience through video instruction over the internet has really been great uh, the last bunch of years as well. I've certainly watched enough of your videos over the years. Whenever I want to learn something new, particularly about Tony Kuiper's uh, luminosity panels, uh, it was always the first port of call was looking at your videos. And I think that was probably how I first came across you in the first place, was buying Tony's panel and then suddenly finding this uh, instruction video that, that was so useful at the time. So thank you very much. And uh, you yeah. said you've got an incredible don't panic voice, which I think is also very helpful under those times. Awesome. Well, you're welcome. And uh, yeah, it's been great how that all worked out. And um, yeah, and the collaboration with Tony over the years has been really wonderful. And uh, yeah, I'm just very grateful to be able to uh, to provide what little I have and the you know, little bits that I've picked up and learned from other people over the years and spread that and pay that out. It's been great. You're too modest. You're far too modest. <laughs> uh, I think your contributions go, is, has been more than, than you're letting up, but anyway, oh. I, I, won't, I won't push you further. Right. <laughs> I'm, I think we're, we're in a situation now where the, the, the photography land, the photography marketplace is so vast. Uh, photography, since we had that conversation back in 2011, so much has changed. There are so many more photographers out there. There are people with far better gear. The software has moved forward exponentially. Um, and it seems to me now that, that people are just as lost creatively as they were 10 years ago. In that, at the time you and I were trying to overcome 
technical limitations of the gear, like exposure blending and things like that. Um, and an awful lot of our, our work was going into correcting the, the limitations of our equipment. Whereas now the equipment is so much better and we can do things way easier. Mm -hmm. And I think the onus is becoming more focused on the fact that, and I was having this conversation with Mark Adamus the other day, is that we're the weakest link still in the creative process. Uh, it doesn't matter how many tools we learn or how many different skills we learn. So what I'm interested from your side is how, how has your interaction with the software changed in this last decade? And how do you see yourself moving forward as a creative person? And do you rely more on the tools these days? Or are you moving away from more technical processing because it's less necessary than it was? Yeah, that's a, that's a always a tough question for me. The kind of you know, like where the the technology and the equipment ends, and where the creativity begins. And I think you know, in reality, it's it's a blend of the two. What I've found, I think, always, and it's wonderful that it is getting, I think, easier and better on all levels, is that um, for what the way I do photography, the technology and the equipment is is part of the package, and the you know there's no way around using a camera, and there's no way around for me using the computer and the software no. that I use. So the more comfortable that I can become with the technology and the equipment, the more it tends to disappear. And the more, you know, I forget that it's there and then I'm just operating in that creative mind space more and more. And that's, and that's I guess, the, the biggest takeaway I have for myself and I think for other people is, is to just do it a lot and don't get too hung up in any one moment on the gear and, and the software and the tech, just do it a lot so that you become more comfortable with it. And through that process, eventually, and it may take a while, it depends, different people have different comfort levels with all this stuff and different progression rates and the different amounts of time that they can put into it. But eventually the, the creative part of you does come through once all the other stuff starts to kind of disappear into the background. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that, that, that it's very difficult to think about the how at the same time as, as trying to express the why uh, of photography. I'm very focused on the why am I doing this or, or, or sort of allowing creativity to be an innate flowing thing rather than a conscious directed thing. Um, right. And I think part of the problem with processing and the way it was taught in my mind was that it became very much a process driven discipline. Right. It was do this, then this, then this, then this, then this. And there was a certain homogeny with the way photographs started turning out because there was a repetitive process and therefore right. there was a repetition of look and feel. Uh, so I think we're in a situation now is we've got a far broader palette of expressive uh, articulation within our developing process. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, I think it's, it's understanding what tools do what or how, mm -hmm. to, how to make something more atmospheric or how to make something more three-dimensional or how to make something more believably deep. So uh, that's something I learned from you, <laughs> more or less, <laughs> really early on, was that concept that doing real well, you know, understanding what the world looks like. And I think this is getting lost a little bit these days in that... <sighs> I don't know how you feel about this, but it's my perception that there's a certain quick fix sort of mindset some of the time now that it's, well, how can I get what I want quickly or what preset can I buy that's going to achieve that for me uh, rather than understanding that three dimensionality is a function of processing. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, that really gets down to where each of us as an individual wants to go with our work and what we're trying to accomplish and what the goals are. And I think, you know, for plenty of people out there, uh, they see something that excites them that someone else has done and they just want to output that, you know, and just tell me what I need to do to, to make that. Uh, and I think that's where it starts for a lot of people. And some people may just, that may be the, the you know, as far as they go in, in this, you know, creative pursuit. And I don't have any problem with that, but I definitely think that 
Yeah, that beyond just trying to recreate a look or something else that you saw uh, is that more internal process of, you know, what does it mean to me? What am I trying to do? Uh, and, you know, what kind of experimentation and trial and error and just kind of almost playing can I do and not following a set, you know, uh, you know cookbook progression of steps, rather, you know, f more following intuition and instinct and creative urges or or just trying things and sometimes just being surprised by what happens <laughs> that you I never would have guessed. A, that's a really wonderful word. I mean, the, when you use the word playing, uh, I, I've always believed that language is really important. I remember when I was at university getting really hung up about the precision of language and I hated the idea of ambiguity and I hated the idea of my, my message being misinterpreted. Um, and I used to get on people's cases on workshops a lot of the time when they were saying, I'm just going to play with this image. And I used to say, you're not playing. This is, this is, this is, if you, if you talk, if you call it playing, then it's, you're, you're trivializing the, the significance of the, the relationship with the data type of thing. I was really, really, uh, kind of, um, slightly obsessed with it being a, not a serious thing, but. And I think that comes from the fact that you and I are professional photographers and our work is our livelihood to a certain extent in that, you know, our, our images are our life uh, in many ways. Right. Uh, so I think I got kind of hung up on that. But even today I was writing a, an article uh, for F-Stoppers and I was explaining the fact that, that having a childlike enthusiasm for what we do is a beautiful way to tap into creativity. Because I think children in particular, you give a kid a piece of paper and some crayons and it's going to just draw away to its heart content. Uh, whereas by the time you're 25 or 35 or in our 50s like you and I are now, if you draw haphazard type things, people just say, oh, that's rubbish, you know. <laughs> right. So I think when we're, when we're young, we get away with being more creative because we're not being subjected to peer pressure quite as much as perhaps children can be. Uh, so I, I'm kind of re-embracing that, that spirit of childlike playfulness. Uh, and well, I think you're great. right. I think when you, when you start processing images, uh, experimenting and playing and taking things down in directions, but I don't think you can do that consciously. And, and this, is a, this, this is my next question for you is, is that how much of your processing is a conscious thing and does that vary depending on the utility of the photograph? Yeah, I would say that probably, uh, boy, I, I've never tried to quantify it, but certainly a big part of the image work that I do, I think the creative developing is very unconscious. You know, it's, or, or I don't know about unconscious, but it's definitely going by feel. And that's one of the reasons why I think I have a challenge. You know, a lot of my instruction is very, um, is very how to, you know, it's like, how do, how do you use this tool or how do you do this certain type of method or, you know, that kind of stuff, because that's very concrete in my mind. And I, I can put words to that. I can explain that and break that down for people. Um, trying to explain what's going on creatively in my mind is much harder because, uh, I don't always know myself, and it's very hard for me to really analyze it and then try to put those to work, put that to words. I think there are a lot of people out there who do who are really good at that. I think you're one of those people. You you have a a, a really um, acute insight into I think your creative thought process, oh. and so your ability to put that into words is one of the things I love shot, about right? um, following what you do. I know that um, Guy Tal is another person who is really good at putting his, you know, his creative thought process into words. So, so that is challenging, but I think it's okay. It's okay if you go by feel. And it, I, the other thing I wanted to say back to the idea of, you know, when you were talking about that childlike uh, sense of just um, experimenting and kind of being somewhat carefree about it, I think that's a great thing also, because for me, it's like f photography is, is like simultaneously 
uh, important and completely not important. <laughs> and, and what I mean by that is it's very, my photography is important to me because it's meaningful to me and I get a lot out of it personally. But in the grand scheme of the universe, photography is to me not important. You know, I mean, how, how, you know, any photo that I take in itself is, is really not that important. And pursuit of photography, I think certain types of photography are probably more important to others. But, but let's be realistic. I take pictures of mountains and trees and lakes and my photography on that sort of scale is not that important. So, you know, I think to remember that and remember that it's, you can't screw it up. You're not going to break anything. You're not going to ruin someone's life. If, if you, if you try something in your creative process and it doesn't turn out, that's okay. You know, yeah. it's not that important. I've, that's right. I've always called uh, Lightroom and Photoshop zero risk environments. You know, <laughs> right. it's, it's like you say, you're not doing open heart surgery. Uh, you can do the, whatever you want. You can pretty much do whatever you want. Now, that, that's a really interesting point, and I've written quite extensively about this in the past, which is that maybe 50 years ago, there was X number of photographs were being made on an annual basis. Uh, now, on a daily basis, I can't remember the statistics of the numbers, but it's hundreds of billions of photographs <laughs> a year. Um, yeah. And the way I looked at that is that, that I make photographs of little moments of engagement in my life, you know, where I, I recognize something in the landscape that somehow resonates with me. Um, and that's what I point my camera at. Because I, I'm less of a grand landscape photographer now than perhaps I was a decade ago. I tend to mm -hmm. isolate smaller elements than I used to. So it's, it's those little focus points around the, the, the world that I kind of zone in on now. And each one of those little recognitions of, of something, whether it's dynamics or color or atmosphere or luminosity or contrast or, you know, uh, the way the water's moving around something in a sensual way. Those are moments in my life that are the, they're little check boxes of, yes, I was present. You know, I, I, I was noticing and engaging and feeling interested and inquisitive. So when I make a photograph, a photograph is basically, uh, for me, is a snapshot of that moment, yeah? Now, I don't expect them to be meaningful on the same level to other people as they are to myself. So I look right. in those as little diamonds. They're, they're little pinpricks of light in, in my life. And when they get thrown onto the internet, they take on a life of, them, of, of their own, and they just join all the billions of other grains of sand that are right. getting posted onto the internet every day. Sure. Um, and realistically, I think throwing that external expectation that they're going to be received in the same way that we receive them ourselves or perceive them ourselves is a very unrealistic thing. And it's exactly what you've just said in that f photographs don't matter, you know, in, in real terms, but what they represent to us is everything, you know, it, it is a massive thing. I, exactly. And s some of those grains of sand will resonate, will resonate with yes. certain people and they may resonate in the way that it resonates with us, you know, the people who created them, or it may resonate in a completely different way. And that's part of the, you know, you know, like the, I love that idea is that, you know, when I look at your photographs, they create a response in me and that may be a totally different feeling than what you had. And yet it's, you know, you're reaching out across time and space with this thing that you did at some point. And then that's coming to me and creating this own experience for, for me. I mean, I think that's wonderful. However small those grains of sand are, um, in that way, you know, they have a lot of meaning as well. So it's just so many layers and levels to, to what we do in photography. I, just, I love it. Maybe it's more meaningful than we think. Uh, it, maybe it is. And that's, <laughs> and that's why I say it's the most meaningful thing and it's the least meaningful thing, kind of almost simultaneously, because how do you, how do you quantify, how do you put uh, a number to meaning like that? So, in, 
rather than trying to answer that question, <laughs> <laughs> which which sounded too metaphysical for me. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it was just like whoa. <laughs> so the you know you, you're like you've said you're you're a very capable technician you know mm -hmm. your, your skills in Lightroom and Photoshop are, are significant which makes you a great educator um, and something that you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago was that we it's very easy for you to articulate processes as you're doing them because you're demonstrating a technique and you're illustrating the technique um, and what you've just described was the difficulty in being expressive about why you're doing something creatively mm -hmm. as it happens. And I had some quite a lot of thoughts about that because quite often when you're teaching, people are expecting you to be creative and explain how you're being creative simultaneously. Right. And for me, that it's very difficult to do also because the very act of consciously articulating what it is you have to do takes you out of the creative state. Uh, and it, it's almost like, um, I think, flow states is the classic parallel, mm -hmm. is that creativity and flow states are essentially the same, I think. And as soon as you're conscious of being in a flow state, you cannot be in a flow state. Um, Thank so you. So I, I think... <laughs> oh. Thank you for putting that to words. That's, that's exactly <laughs> correct. Right, good. Because you were just describing something that I, I recognize in myself all the time. Uh, you and I know a guy uh, who lives in the Seattle, uh, I think is where he lives, and he was on a private workshop with me in Scotland a few years ago, and he said, listen, Alistair, I just want to watch you being creative. Uh, so it was like, great. So I cracked open a file and was sat in Lightroom, and he was sat beside me in my office at home, um, and about 15 seconds, and he said, why did you do that? And I went, no. <laughs> yeah. That isn't how, that's not how this is going to go. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, oh, that's brilliant. Um, yeah, and that's that, that's a, a really great point. And I think for anyone else, I mean, I, I think to watch someone be creative, if, if you can put yourself in a space to be able to do that, could be very instructive, I think. On the other hand, it could be the most boring and frustrating thing to watch. Because I know that when I'm if, if, if I could step outside myself and watch myself work on an image or take a photograph, it's tedious, it moves incredibly slowly. Half the things I do end up, I back out of, I reverse. All right. And inside my head as I'm going through that process, it's fascinating. You know, because the thought processes and whatever is going on with me creatively makes that so interesting to me. But for someone to just watch that, it must be maddening and extremely boring and confusing. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. That's really so curious. I, my, 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 my creative process is almost completely the opposite from that. Oh, really? It's, it's almost entirely a one-way street. I, I very rarely back out of cul-de-sacs. Um, wow. Yeah, that, that's curious. Oh, that that's, is interesting. Uh, so you feel like you're able to just continue moving, moving forward. I tend to, I th and I think that's how I developed this whole history brush processing. Right. Uh, where, whereas, um, because I don't feel the need to kind of re readjust a layer or, or adjust something that I've already done. Uh, it, it tends to be a very much a linear thing for me where I'm just always moving. I mean, when I did use layers, I just used to flatten all the time. I'd make an adjustment, flatten, make an adjustment, flatten, make an adjustment, flatten. That's um, amazing. Yeah, so for me, watching you do the history brush method in those videos that you've been um, putting out recently, that was fascinating for me to watch and terrifying at the same time because, uh, you know, my creative process is so different. I do a ton of going back. And so that idea of moving forward and not coming back and circling back and changing things that I've already done and that once... I've gotten to a certain state and left the image, then that's really where that image is at. That's, um, yeah, like I said, that's not my, my creative process. I am constantly second guessing or trying things that don't work and then backing out of them and trying something else going down a completely different uh, fork in the road. So yeah, different, different ways to be creative and I love that. Well, absolutely. And I think that, that this is the beauty of it is that we're all using the same tools, but we're using them in different right. ways. Um, mm -hmm. Now, 
the I think there's a certain predictability of adjustments. You know, when when we make a contrast adjustment, for example, uh, because I I always uh, look at what is the impact of that thing going to be. Uh, so right. if if you add more contrast, essentially the image has more uh, more impact because uh, mm -hmm. contrast is a volume slider. Uh, it's it's a way of increasing the the voice of either the global uh, thing or a local thing. So, for example, mm -hmm. if we want to make uh, a foreground more contrasty, then the foreground is saying, "Look at me, look at me, look at me." Whereas, if we reduce contrast in the foreground, the consequence is it's saying, "Ignore me a little bit." Uh, and right. and I think that's the way I approach processing is basically looking at the file and saying. Uh, what's the thing that made me point the camera at it in the first place? So is it a relationship between a foreground element, a midground element and a background element? And therefore, what does that relationship mean? And where, where's this flow of consciousness going to be when one looks at the image? Um, right. So I, I kind of approach processing very much on a, a quite intuitive uh, feeling way uh, and I think you've, you've more or less said the same um, it's just really it's uh, I find it fascinating how you know you could take you know a bunch of us all to the same place and we'd be pointing our cameras at different things or even if we're pointing our cameras at the same things we'd be going back and making different photographs with that stuff so the the, the, the whole idea of being an individual it's you know, people talk about where is, you know, what's creativity and what's personal style. And it's just like, it's in us, you know, everybody's creative because we all have eyes mm -hmm. and consciousness. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's, it's very, it's very true. Um, yeah. And that, that concept of, you know, we, we are just creative. I mean, naturally, but how do, I guess, different people think about and relate to creativity in different ways. And some of us spend more time uh, pursuing it or thinking about it or working at it than others. And um, yeah, that is such a deep, we're, we're going outside of my comfort zone now, you know, <laughs> that idea of, uh, <laughs> you know, how, how to, how to, for me to even think about things like that. I mean, I know to myself what you're talking about this idea of contrast and, and I just see it as this, you know, so, so contrast is a thing. There is a definition to it. There is actually even measurements for contrast in a visual medium. Sure. Um, and so at the beginning of someone getting into this, just understanding what is contrast, first of all, understanding the definition of it. And then second of all, being able to know, okay, so increasing or decreasing contrast, what will that look like in this image? And then the third stage, I guess we get to is, I know what contrast is gonna do. The question for me is, do I want more contrast or less contrast? Or, or where do I want it? And that's for me the part where, it's hard for me to always move forward because I, I sometimes have to try it. I'm like, I know what contrast is going to do here, but I'm going to make contrast, apply contrast, and then I have to kind of be with that for a while and decide, is that feel right to me? Is that feel like what I'm hoping to express? <laughs> and a lot of times it isn't. And that's where I guess the going right. back for me is, is like I see that contrast and realize, I mean, it did what I thought it would do, but now that I see it, I don't like it, or that's not where I wanted to go with this. Right. And why don't I want to go that way? I, sometimes I don't know. I just doesn't feel right. Well, I think that's a curious thing as well. And I, I, I think a lot of, you know, you and I both see people in workshops a lot and we, and we see images that they're making and we see, we see the way they're approaching image making. And the, it became very on vogue for a long time to kind of just make everything more. You know, so that the foreground was more, the background was more, everything was just louder. Uh, you know, right. clouds filled with grit and contrast and unnatural looking. Um, and I think something I've always advocated for people is if you're struggling to know where an image is going to go, start with real. 
you know, start with mm -hmm. introducing depth, three dimensionality, tonal, uh, what's I call it, tonal consistency. So the sky and the foreground look like they belong luminos luminosity wise as part of the same thing. Um, and it's so much easier to do now than it was 15 years ago or 10 years ago when you and I were last sort of speaking about these things in a, in a right. one to one basis. Um, and because if you learn how to make images look real, i.e. foregrounds mm -hmm. look like foregrounds, backgrounds look like backgrounds, and the tonal relationships are consistent, because you and I know how the world looks, is that you know, you'll be familiar with the expression, the transition of blacks, your deepest shadows and detail will be in the foreground, and then you get this diffusion towards the background. So that, that transition from one thing to another thing is the journey. You know, and, and those things are, if we make those transitions feel real, then that's a step in the right direction. And that, that, this all happens before creativity, because making something look real isn't creativity necessarily. Right. You know, it's just making right. it look more believable as a, as a three-dimensional subject as opposed to a two-dimensional subject. So right. I think what we do is we confuse what creativity really is part of the time. And the people who think sometimes feel pressurized to be creative every time they sit in front of the computer. And I, right. I know that that's just not the case, you know. And I, I, for me, a lot of that pressure that you're talking about or what the image, you know, where we want to take it. And I talk to a lot of people about this, uh, you know, in teaching situations is, is intention. Yeah, you know, because they'll ask me, what, "What do you think about this? Does this is this right, or does this look good?" And my question that I always ask back to them before I answer is, "Well, wh what's your intention? What are you trying to do, or what is it that you want it to be?" And then once they explain that to me, then I can say, "Well, then you nailed it," or. Oh, no, I don't think if that was your intention, I don't think you're getting there. Right. So, you know, if I look in a photo and it looks completely unrealistic to me, but then I ask them, well, what was your intention? And their intention is that exact thing. Then my answer is <laughs> spot Joke, on. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> but if they say, you know, I want this to feel, you know, X and I'm looking at it and I don't see any X there, then I can say that. Well, I, I think if that's your intention, here are some things you might want to try that will communicate that intention to me. Right. Um, and so I, that, that idea of intention, I think, in creativity is, you know, what are you trying to do? And that's why I think a lot of this that we see people critiquing other people's creativity, um, I feel like people haven't stopped. I mean, they're putting their own intentions into the piece. When they say, oh, this looks too this way or not enough that way or it's too much of this or not enough of that, well, that's your intention for someone else's piece. But I, my first question is, what were you trying to do? I may or may not you know, appreciate what you were trying to do, but part of my evaluation is you know, how close did you get to your own mark? Right. And if you're spot on your own mark every time, to me, that's ultimate kind of mastery of, of the creative process for you. I just may not like it. Right, absolutely. And uh, <laughs> I think what we, do, what we confuse quite a lot of the time is opinion versus absolute truth. <laughs> right, know, they're, they're, <laughs> well, there's that. They're absolutely not the same thing. Um, I have a question which is somewhere in my mind. Uh, it came to me while we were talking, which is why do you think it's easier for us to judge and have opinion about other people's work, yet still have lots of self-doubt about our own. Oh, fascinating. Uh, I think that's, that must be part of human nature. I, I don't know what the, the evolution of, of uh, judgment is in that, that particular state, but obviously that's something that we do that's kind of ubiquitous across the human race is uh, we're constantly judging things. I mean, and we're also very, um, I, I, I think self-doubt is also another thing that we just do. And it's interesting to think about that. Um, yeah, it's so, it is so easy to immediately put values, our value judgments onto the things we see. 
Ah, oh, boy, I don't have. I, I wish I had a more concise answer for <laughs> well, you. That's it, fascinating idea. Well, you know, I've, I've thought, what do you think? I'm, yeah, I, I, I thought that was coming. Um, <laughs> I, I've thought a lot about this. I mean, I used to travel a lot um, before I turned pro, and I used to read a lot of philosophy and psychology and stuff because it was better than drinking in hotel bars all the time. So, um, <laughs> you know, I, I used to spend a lot of time reading stuff like this. So I have thought a lot about the, the sort of the psychology of visual design. In fact, I've lectured on the, the psychology of human design. Um, and judgment is innate. It's, a, it's, a, it's something we do, like you say, all the time. Whether you're going to a store to buy a shirt or whether you're going to the store to buy peppers and you're making a decision of which one you want to pick, out of the 500 peppers in front of you. Uh, and it's very easy when we look at other people's photographs, just say like, don't like, like, don't like, like, don't like. And we don't really go through an analytical, critical process anymore. Like we did maybe 30 years ago, you'd buy a photo book, you'd look at the photographs. And if you didn't like it, you'd be asking the question, why don't I like it? You wouldn't just be saying terrible photographer. You know, <laughs> Whereas I think we get a lot right. of that these days is that if we don't like something, it's the photographer's fault. Um, right. So I think judgment is something we do innately. And where I'm trying to get with my own work is to try and eliminate judgment almost entirely uh, from my own creative process. And certainly when I'm looking at other people's work um, and I'm, I'm almost getting to the point where I'm prepared to accept that anything is valid, but there's a consequence to it. So if you compose or arrange your content in a certain way, there's a consequence to that. It's either easy to read, hard to read, obvious or obscure. Uh, it's either harmonious or dissonant. There's, there's a consequence. And I call these things emotional fingerprints. I reckon an image comes, the first thing we resonate or, or, or don't resonate with is the emotional fingerprint that's just a function of itself. So, you know, I look at the images on the wall of your studio and they have an emotional fingerprint as soon as you see them. And they're a function of luminosity, color, geometry, contrast, um, and the, 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 the atmosphere in them. And what you stick in within a frame is speaking volumes about you and the place uh, and the viewer because all of us have a unique perception of how we look at things. So, I mean, I hate this concept of, of right and wrong. I hate this concept of telling people, you have to do it this way. Um, it, it, so the, the, the fact that you're such an awesome educator, I think is amazing because the way, you're, the way you put the tools out there for people is that there's the palette, there's the, these are the consequences of this tool. You know, and it's like if you want to add more atmosphere, then you can be looking at negative dehaze. You can be looking at reducing clarity. You can be looking at warming something up or cooling it down. There's all of these different consequences of the actions that we do. So, yeah, carry on doing what you're doing because you do it so well. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I and I think I mean, uh, you're giving me so much. I'm going to be up all night because <laughs> now you've got my gears turning. You, uh, but it's this is really gets down to the heart of of so many things. And I love the idea of consequence, uh, you know, and the idea of everything we do has consequence. And you know that we are making certain choices in how we go about the whole process and anything we do. And um, you know, being aware, I guess, maybe you're being in tune with those consequences. Uh, is is part of mastery of that. Um, I wonder how much do you think in this thought process and the stuff that you've clearly thought so. Sorry, in this thought process and the stuff that you've th clearly thought so much about. Um, how much of this do you think it's important to try to control and direct, and how much of it should just be more unconscious and you know that you it is almost going by instinct or feel I think uh, <clears throat> I remember you and I having a conversation way way back and you introduced an expression to me which was the utility of a photograph 
yeah, because back then, you know, you were a professional photographer and you were making stock and you were making prints and, right. you know, there was more utility right. spectrum, I guess, then than there maybe right. is now. Um, sure. So I think the utility of the photograph depends. So if I'm making a photograph to illustrate a workshop on a website or if I'm using a photograph to illustrate a point I'm making on an article uh, or if I'm posting an image to stick on social media, whatever that output is kind of determines what articulation am I trying to put across. Uh, and so therefore, if I'm, if I'm writing an article, it's like, okay, I need an image that illustrates atmosphere. Then obviously right. I'm going to go in and find something that illustrates that point. So the, there's a conscious decision uh, as to the image that I'm choosing and how I process it. Now, I, I basically divorce all conscious thought from creativity. I, if I'm consciously directing or trying to predetermine where I'm going to take an image, I don't consider that creativity. That is processing. That, that's predictable. Um, I'm going to do this and this will happen. I'm going to right. do that and then something else will happen and it's taking me towards my goal. Uh, right. So so it's just like, okay, the foreground needs to have more detail in it so it feels closer. The background needs to have more atmosphere so it feels further away. I want to have a transition from cool to warm, from dark to light, from texture to smooth. It's all about utility of transitions to a certain extent. Uh, if I'm being creative, there's zero conscious thought. It's just like, here we go. <laughs> you know, It's like, strap in and let's go for a ride type of thing. And that's a totally different... Um, the utility of that is a window to the soul uh, because I don't want to drive because if I'm driving, then I will only end up somewhere I can imagine. Whereas if I just let my unconscious steer and take me where it wants to go, then I get to the point where it's like, well, where did that come from? <laughs> how, how, <laughs> where did this come from? And what's that telling yeah. me about who I was when I was doing it? So that, right. that's my kind of... I, I believe that images, when you're in the field, the way I shoot is sketching. I'm sketching the landscape. And those mm -hmm, sketches mm -hmm. tell me something of who I was at that time because I'm drawn right. to, I might be drawn to atmosphere, I might be drawn to calm, I might be drawn to chaos, I might be drawn to color, mm -hmm. I might be drawn to uh, mis mystery, uh, whatever it might be. So the images that I make when I'm in the field are a function of what's available at the time plus who is taking them or who right. is sketching them. And the same thing that happens in front of the computer is that I, the images that spark something in me, con a creative awareness, I call it, something right. might spark a little, okay, but I, and it's almost like, yes, here we go. And it's like, it, it's a surprise, you know, because I, I'll go directions that I don't, I mean, I'll start an image by dropping the exposure by five stops or, you know, just doing something right. completely outrageous. So, uh, sure. But yeah, op open to. But sorry, carry on. Oh, I was just going to say, but to go back to kind of your driving uh, analogy, so that idea of you know sometimes you're 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 going down a certain route when you're driving and you're getting to a known destination. Yep. But then other times you're not. You don't know where you're going. You don't know where you're going to end up. But even you can't drive completely unconsciously because you can't just let go of the wheel and close your eyes uh, because you know then the, you know then the car doesn't go anywhere I've, I've and used you this, end up in I've, a horrible I've, accident. I've thought about this analogy before, and I'm sure that doesn't come as a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, if you're, we quite often find ourselves when we're driving, we find ourselves in a flow state. You, you, you're kind right. of you're. Yeah absolutely tuned in to the road and you might be listening to a podcast or you might be talking to someone uh, next to you but but you, you have no consciousness of driving you know you're signaling right. and steering and sh shifting gears and whatever without thought so there right. is and unconscious driving the only thing you're actually doing is is responding visually to stimuli so you see right. the but corner coming but the fundamentals of drive you're still utilizing the fundamentals of driving, those basic rules of... Without thought. How do I keep the car on the road? Without thought. And how, 
Without exactly, and so that's, that's the same as processing is that is that you can you can drive an image forward without consciously right. steering. Right, and that's where I guess where I was getting to right. is that working in that way, you're still using those fundamentals of image developing that you could follow procedurally. Um, they're still there, they're still being utilized, but not for any particular purpose of going down a certain path and ending at a specific endpoint. Yeah, I mean, to, 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 to sort of take that metaphor to its, to its nth degree is that you're, you're using the car to get you to a destination, but you didn't have a destination in mind. Uh, right. And likewise, we're using Lightroom and Photoshop to take our image to a destination without having a preconceived idea of where that was necessarily going. And that is different from starting an image and saying, right, I want this to represent a place and therefore it has to, it has to comply to certain physical reality right. rules of color and contrast. Because you know, the, right. the, the world is what it is. And, it, and I always think that viewers uh, and everybody has experiential reference points, you know, where we know what mountains kind of look like, we kind of know what grass looks like, we know what clouds look like. And if we cross those boundaries, it can be a very dangerous path to cross uh, because <laughs> people just start going, uh -uh. you know, that's, that's unbelievable to me. Um, right. So yeah, it, it's a curious thing. And I think as landscape photographers, you know, this is a, probably a conversation for another day because we're going to end up talking for like three hours <laughs> not with YouTube's longest right. video. Um, you and I could do that no problem. <laughs> I think we will. But, you know, some, <laughs> something for another day is, is really the, the explicit contra uh, uh, contract that photographers have with viewers in portraying reality uh, in, in that you know, this, the, this place exists uh, is, is one argument, you know, in terms of compositing or putting, moving structure around or rocks or flowers or whatever it might be, uh, versus sort of saying, well, this is a place that I went and this is what I saw and this is what I photographed, rather than just creating something in Photoshop. So I think there's, there's, mm -hmm. there's other things that we can probably talk about in the future. That is, that's a, that's a whole other conversation <laughs> right there. <laughs> I can see it now. Yeah, let's uh, tune in for part two. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I, I'm so grateful that we have this opportunity to do this. I mean, the technology, the fact that we've got high-speed internet and we can have these conversations in real time when you're in, in Oregon and I'm in the west of Scotland, in our bunkers. Uh, mine isn't as glorious looking as yours, but um, yeah. Well, and I agree. It's uh, wonderful. Thank you for this, uh, this chance to get to hang out with you, man. Yeah, and uh, well, let's do it again. Absolutely. Anytime uh, you know where to find me. Yeah, well, I don't think we're going anywhere anytime soon. I would like to say before <laughs> no. we close, though, that we'd really encourage people to be safe and to, to make sure we, we try and adhere to the recommendations that's coming. Uh, and hopefully we're all going to get through this uh, as best we can. But it's a, it's a long road ahead, I fear. Uh, so I think we're going to have lots of time to have these conversations, unfortunately. Fortunately and unfortunately. Yes, it's true. Yes, mixed, mixed blessings. I think that's a perfect uh, summary for the end of this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks a lot, Alistair. No worries, man. I uh, wish you be well. Yeah. <laughs> perfect timer. <laughs> <laughs> there came the timer. <laughs> right. Uh, indeed, wish you well, mate. All the best. Take care, Alistair. It's really great to see you and talk to you. Cheers, man.